Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the last class of this module, and our last the class topic is about the stair and lamp. So today we'll discuss about the stair and lamp. The we will study design issue as well as code compliance, and then we just talk about the more the detail assemblage of the stair and interior detail assemblage on the four forty five. Today, more about the interesting about the basic the stair design concept and how you can meeting the this minimum the requirement the required from the IBC. Um, there's a two stair type, which is the landmark stair and egress stair. What is about the landmark stair? It is more oriented toward the design, which is a, it is more about provide the vertical accent of the your the open space design. But what about the egress stair? It is oriented toward evacuation issue related to the building code. And when there's a fire or emergency issue, people have to be escaping through the your egress stair. So from this reason, egress stair is more uh, strict to require the code compliance. The what is about the fire minimum rating hours and then how people can escape in through the this egress stair. So we talk about the some the idea about the egress stair design the later of this lecture. Uh, let's talk about the basic function of a stair. The why we need a stair. Why we need a stair? Our this is a primary function is vertical movement, right? The stair is connect floor to floor. It is connected vertically. Um, what do you need to consider when you design a stair? Do you think about that this stair is comfortable? Is easy to going up and down? So means when you design a stair, you should consider about human comfort, safety, and experience. So your stair always consider about these three points. So after consider about these the factors, it's much easier to the going up and down, and then it is more reasonable stair design you can propose. Um, and also you should consider stair cannot be part of accessible route because of the step. The wheelchair user they can use in the step. It means you require to elevator for the wheelchair access. However, you need to consider ADA for your stair design. It has to occupy the people having the mild disability, which is the some people has a mild disability. They are still using the some the stair. So means so we still consider about this ADA rather than just kind of designing the the typical stair. Okay. Also, stair is related to the safety. So when you just designing about this stair, stair are the number one cause of accident in the home. So from the, this region, you have to be provide the optimal dimension because of the safety and human comfort, also ADA for the mild disability. Okay. Let's talk about the stair terminology. So let's look at the, some the basic terminology of a stair. So let's zoom in the one step. Let's zoom in. And then you can just kind of uh, know about the, how we can call this part, the vertical part. It is called as the riser. And how we can call this horizontal piece? It can call as the treat. What about the intersecting between the riser and treat? It is called as nosing. Okay. Please know about the, this terminology. And this, this is a very basic terminology to understanding about the stair. And then more terminology here. So you have a rending. When you have a stair, you have a flat surface. It is called as the rending. When you have a stair going up and down, it is called as the flight or run. And then when you consider about the stair, you should have a guardrail to protect the fall down. So this is a guardrail design. And then you should have a handrail as well. Handrail, 
is designed for the providing stability of the moving. It's guided to moving up and down. Okay, so guardrail it has to be have four in, forty four inch minimum height, and your handrail it has to be thirty four inch to thirty eight inch. Okay, I think this is a really important number to memorize it. So you just kind of easy to see the these terminology from the photograph here. This is after store. You can see the guardrail. You remember the guardrail height have to be more than forty four inches, and you can see the handrail, and you can see the guardrail here, right? So what is function of the guardrail? It's protect the falling down. And what is about the function of the handrail? It's guide people going up and down, right? And you can also see the the guardrail here and the handrail here, right? And when you design a stair, you should consider about ergonomics. You remember about the human factor and anthropometric data. So in every single architecture space and product, you should considering about the human factors. Basically from the human factor, when you design a stair like this way, you should know about the this, the leg, or human body factor. It is very difficult to going up and down. It's too steep. Or if you just kind of design it too shallow, it's too gentle. It is also pretty uncomfortable going up and down. So when you think about this too steep, it's very uncomfortable and dangerous. I think this is a young generation like you guys. It's okay to going up and down. But old generation is hard to going up and down. Also think about too shallow. It is also it's uncomfortable and also sometimes kind of dangerous because it's not the constant from the human factor. So from this region, how you can propose optimal demand for the, your steel design. So the IBC requires this demand here. 7 inch maximum riser and 11 inch the minimum treat. This is a requirement. Please memorize this number. I think this is a very important dimension to designing about your stair. Okay, 7 inch maximum riser and 11 inch the minimum treat. How you can memorize it? You can just simply memorize from the 7 Eleven convenience store. 7 Riser and 11 treat. Okay, but when you have uh, some designing about the monument, the stair, you should consider about uh, this ergonomic rule two riser plus one treat, it has to meet 24 inches to 25 inches. Okay, this is a base script from the human factor to going up and down comfortably and safely in the monumental stair. This is an example. When you have 3 inch riser, what is about your treat? So simply adapt, apply the, this number to the, this formula. 3 inch and T it has to be 24 inch to 25 inches and your treat to have two meaning 18 inch to 19 inches. What about this? If you have a 5 inch riser, you simply apply this number here and 2 times 5 plus 1 treat equal 24 to 25, right? So basically from here, you can just calculate it and then you can just get the T dimension which is the 14 inch to 15 inches, okay? So just understanding about how we can the calculating the monumental stair, the riser and treat basically from the this calculation. And for your stair design, you also consider about the landing. But why do we need a landing in a stair? So you can see the Great Wall of China, and then it has the long flight of the stair with the no landing. This is a kind of example. It's another stair, but you can just kind of example of a long flight. So when you're having a long way down, if people just coming from the top, 
they are keep falling down to, to the bottom. So means if you are now, if you don't have a kind of landing place, it is kind of more safety region. Also, it is kind of more about the last area. People just can stay and then rest, or you also protecting the these the falling down situation. Okay. So from this region, the, you need to remember the landing requirement for your stair design. So you have to be designed the landing when single flight, which is the single flight here, the exceed 12 feet over rise, you should l provide this landing area. So means if your single flight is more than 12 feet, you have to provide landing space. So single flight, which is a single flight, cannot exceed 12 feet of the rise. Okay, please know about this dimension. So it means if you did, if you are stair and then floor to the this place, floor to floor is only 10 feet. You don't need a landing area. However, if you have in the more than 12 feet, anyway, you should provide this landing space for the design. Um, this is switchback stair most. The egress stair having the switch back. In this case, the stair, the one flight and another flight in between, you should provide the landing area. And in this landing area, if you have more than 12 feet, you should provide the landing space. Okay. And handrail design. Handrail is a rail that is desired to be grasped by the hand so as to provide support, which is guide people going up and down. But to designing of the handrail, we also meeting the IBC code requirement. So when you just extension, which is the top extension and bottom extension, this is a stair nose, the, this is a bottom stair nosing. And then from the top stair nosing, you have to be considered about the top extension. It is top extension, you have to be 12 inch extension, okay? And the bottom extension from the bottom, the stair nosing, you should provide the 12 inch plus 1 treat. So you remember what is 1 treat? 11, 7 11, which is a 11 inch minimum space. It means you should provide 11 inch plus 12 inch. It means it usually provide 3, 23 inch extension at the bottom, the handrail, and then 12 inch top, the extension of your handrail. And also you have to be know about the, some your the height of your handrail. It is have to be 34 inches to 38 inches. Okay. Just kind of repeat again. The, your handrail have to be the 34 inches to the 38 inches. And the top extension from the nosing, you have to be provide the 12 inch extension. And the bottom extension from the bottom nosing, you should provide the 11 inch which is a treat plus the 12 inch extension it means it mostly provides 23 inch extension from the bottom and also have to be understanding about the handrail the grip size it is the one and a quarter inch to two inch it is basically from the human factor which is your hand size so you can just provide this dimension for the, your handrail um, when you're designing about your steel, once again, you should provide the handrail and guardrail. The guardrail is more about the safety. It protect to fall down. And handrail, it is more guide people going up and down. So handrail have to provide 34 inch to 38 inch. And guardrail, you have to provide 42 inch from the landing or the stair treat area. So let's talk about the handrail. Handrail has to be provided, which is it always required. The dimension have to be 34 inches to 38 inches. And the guardrail, the guardrail is have to provide 42 inches, okay, to protect the falling down. It protect any stair or lamp with a fall of a 30 inch high or more. If your stair or lamp is more than 30 inch from the floor, you should provide guardrail. If you're less than 30 inch, you don't need to be provide guardrail. 
but if your stair or the lamp is more than 30 inch, you should provide guardrail. And then, what is about the 4 inch sphere rule? And your guardrail also requires maximum 4 inch gap between the rail or cable. You can also make in the solid, the plane, the guardrail. In this case, you don't worry about the 4 inch sphere rule. But when you're using the, this bar or cable, you should pro considering of the 4 inch gap maximum between the rail. So 4 inch diameter sphere cannot pass through any opening for the guardrail. We think about the 4 inch sphere tennis ball. It, it, it is the, your guardrail never allow this, the sphere into the, this gap. So it means between the, this, the, the cable to cable or bar to bar, it has to be less than 4 inch. Okay? Um, this is a more to see the key dimension when you design a stair. The first one, you need to be dimension 80 inch. Okay. This is a 80 inches minimum head clear space. You remember what the, this is related to the protruding dimension. I think that is really important number. 80 inch clear floor space. And then your handrail has to meet 34 inch to 38 inches. And then you remember about this diameter. It's kind of one and a quarter inch to the two inches, okay? And you remember about the riser? What is about the riser? Which is a seven inch, and then the treat have to be 11 inch. What about the landing space? If your one flight is more than 12 feet, you should provide landing space. So now we talk about the stair sizing for the egress stair, how we can design the egress stair. So when you know about the egress stair, you should know about the occupant and the occupancy concept. And occupant road is the life, safe, life safety code. So occupant, it is life safety code. Okay. And the two understanding about the occupancy, you should the answer these four questions. So first one, can occupant people help themselves? It means, so when you design hospital, these people need support to escaping from the space. Is there highly hazardous material in the space? If your factory have a hazardous material, it require more the fire rating hours. Do people know their way? Are, are they familiar with the space? If you're just kind of designing the theater, so many people just kind of first time to visit this theater, they don't know about the, how they escaping from. It means they need this kind of program require more fire rating hours. The force are occupant vulnerable due to age, ability, or activity. So when you're designing about a senior house, in this case, they are much slower escape from the space comparing to the dormitory, right? Like you guys stay here. Do you guys stay like a dome? In this case, also you need a more fire rating hours. Okay, so basically from the, this four question, you can decide about the the minimum fire rating hours. So it is also like the the basically the concept from occupant occupancy. So this concept we already discussed from the, your three forty five and five forty five class. You already know about the, what is the concept of occupant, what is about the construction type. So basically from the, this occupancy and then we using, we using the, this occupancy to calculating your stair width. So before we jump into the stair width calculation, we kind of watching the, this video clip. The professional fire protection engineer talk about the, this occupant road and then this is a very well summarized to understanding about occupant road okay so let's watch the, this video together and then jumping to occupant road factors Well, occupancy loads are important. They give us the number of people that can occupy a given space. However, every occupancy has different requirements. So the occupant load is based on two primary factors. 
uh, that being how many people can we get into that given space based on its occupancy and then uh, for the square footage. So we'd have to look at the square footage in the code to see how many people are allowed per square foot and then we'd get a number and we would usually go in and say okay uh, length times width we subtract the permanent objects and we, we come up with a, a number of people that can occupy that space. The second factor is do we have enough door capacity with to accommodate that number of people. So typically when we do an occupant load if we go in and we calculate that number for the, the floor area we then come back and we say okay do we have enough door capacity with and there's there's some math that goes into that and we find out uh, for instance that there's not enough capacity with and we're going to lower the occupant load to accommodate the doors. So we're always going to be very conservative with our numbers. The occupant load is based on the occupancy itself and the occupancy is determined by the use of the building. So we may have a large structure uh, let's say we just have a large square building. Um, depending on what we use it is going to depend on the factor or the, the square footage per person. So for instance, for most assembly occupancies, nightclubs, uh, churches, restaurants, we're going to have a factor of 7 to 15 square feet per person. And 7 is if everybody's just standing next to each other and 15 square feet per person for tables and chairs. Uh, whereas if we went to a business, we took that same shell and we said, okay, it's a business occupancy just for doing routine business. It's going to be at 100 square feet per person, and we don't take out fixed objects. It's just the gross square footage at 15. So it's really the use which determines the occupancy, and the occupancy, you go to a chart of occupant loads for that given use, and it tells you how many square feet per person. Impediments, you know, some of the things that we'll find on during an inspection. Uh, fixed objects contribute. Obviously, if we have um, lar uh, a, we have a uh, nightclub with, with bars and tables and pool tables, you can't walk and you can't occupy that space. So in that instance, we would subtract that out to get your actual available square footage. First is adding on to the existing uh, floor print of the building or changing the occupancy. Okay. Um, however, um, removing fixed objects, removing impediments. Um, sometimes if you want to uh, change out some of your building space and you want to have more people but you want to keep the same footprint, maybe you want to move some walls and some fixed objects out of the way. But that's really, uh, that's really about it um, other than changing the occupancy. We, we often have a building where somebody's got some sort of occupancy like a like a school and, and later on that building becomes unoccupied and then they want to make it a gymnasium or something like that. Well then obviously the factor changes and what you can what you can do with that building changes as, as well as the occupant load. So those are the types of things that we would look at in order to make an increase. The occupant load of the building typically determines whether or not a fire alarm system or a sprinkler system is required. Um, there's a lot of misnomers of that. We, we seem to think that if our building has sprinklers, we can add more people or we can do uh, certain things to our buildings. That, that's not true. The, the square footage requirements and the capacity with requirements all stay the same. So if I have a given space and I have enough doors and I have enough uh, square footage to occupy the you know, with people, well then that solely determines the occupant load. And then that number is whether or not we get triggered into a sprinkler system or a fire alarm system. It's not the opposite way around. So if I have a small building and it can only accommodate 100 people, but it's a sprinkler building, that doesn't mean I can add people to it. I still have to, I, I'm still set to the parameters of the square footage and the occupiable square, the occupiable door width. I think so you just kind of getting summarized what is about the occupant load from the previous video. Um, now we talk about occupant load factors. So occupant load factor, uh, it can be calculating from the square footage of the, your space divided by occupant load factors. So where did you guys find that, where you guys can find the occupant load factor? It is IBC, the table 1004.1.2. You can see the function of the space. You can just find that the program here, and then occupant load factors here. And you can just see the sum of part. You can show the gross and sum of part of the net. What is about the difference between the gross and net? The gross is total area 
but net is usable, useful, and then habitable space. For example, when you design the lecture room, the lecture room, it has the lecture space. You guys are sitting and lecture area, but also having the, some storage area. That area is not including the storage area, only the calculating the using area. But gross area just including the whole things. So you can just kind of see the gross and net concept from the this table. And you can just kind of see the occupant load. It is square footage divided by the occupant load factors. So this is an example you better understanding about this concept. Uh, when you design office, but you want to know about the occupant load. So basically from the these, the formula, so you already know about it is the 5,000 gross the square feet per floor. So it means 5,000. You should find that occupant load factors. So you can find that the business area and it said occupant load factor is 100. So it means divide by 100, which is the, it is the 50 occupant load. So it means the, within the 5,000 square foot, the 50 people can use in the space in the business purpose. Okay, so it means hundred gross, it means one person can occupy per hundred square foot. Okay, so basically from this one, you can get in the this number, All right? So it means from this calculation, occupant load, what is about the how, much, how many people can use in the space legally in a certain purpose, right? So this is a calculation to know about the this occupant load, okay? So using the this occupant road, you can decide stairway and the stair width requirement from the IBC. So now you should check about IBC thousand of five. It indicating here, it said a mean of egress capacity factor of zero point three inch per occupant. It means each occupant have the zero point three inch width. Okay, and if your design has the sprinkler system, the factor can be 0 0.2, okay? Um, except the group H and I2, because I2 is institution which is the, the hospital, and then H is harder to material the program. So, except this one, if you have a sprinkler building, you can re replace the 0 0.2 from the 0 0.3. So, understanding from here, if you have a non sprinkler building, it is 0 0.3 inch per occupant. It means each occupant can have 0 0.3 inch for your stair width. And fully sprinkler building, each occupant occupy and require 0 0.2 inch for the stair width. But you have to be checking about your project has the, the sprinkler or not. So you can just kind of apply the, these. The concept to deciding about the, your the, your stair width. So in this example, image office tower. You wanna build in the office tower. It has the 50 story, and then this whole the occupant road is 5,000 people, and each floor has the 15,000 square foot. It means so will occupant stack up, so that stair must get the wider as they go down. So it means here is 53 here to here. And then people just escaping through the this the ground level. So it means the ground level is stacked of five thousand people, right? So it means when you're deciding about the stair width, you should consider about the five thousand people. So it means it is the 0.3 inch because it is considered a non sprinkler building. So it means from this calculation, it's 5,000 times 0.3 inches because it's per occupant occupied 0.3 inch width, right? So from this one, you can consider about the 5,000 people and the 0.3 factor. So you can have calculating 1,500 inches, which is 125 feet. So do you think 
we can design in 125 feet wide stair. Maybe not. It's, it's, on, it's, it's impossible to design 125 feet stair width, right? So from the this region, you have to be concerned about the actual concept. So when you see the concept here, so when you have a fire in your building, the people from the ground level, they escape the first and the second floor, people who stay in the second floor, they escaping the secondly. And then the third floor, the people in the third floor, they escaping the third. And fifth floor, they escaping the last, right? So means it is not a stack from the top to bottom, it is kind of a flowing, it's sequentially escaping from the ground level to the fifth floor. So from the, this region, you have a 5,000 and then you have a 53, you have to be divided by 50, okay? And then next example is better to see, the same example. You have office tower and the 53, okay, same here. And you have a 5,000 people and you need a two stair, okay? and then 15,000 square feet per floor, and it is non-sprinkler building. So how we can find out the occupant road? You should find out the 50,000 people, right? This is the total number. And you should divide by the 53, right? Because you remember about the people escaping from the floor to floor, and then ground level first, and fifth floor the last. From this one, you should divide by the 50, then now you have a two stair and divide by two. From this calculation, you have a 50 people per floor. Okay, so this is a kind of a starting point to deciding over your stair width. Now you know about the 50 people, but you remember about the non sprinkler building, it is the factor is a 0 0.3. From here, you can see. So you have a 0 0.3. So we're using this factor to decide about your stair width. Okay, so means you have a 50 and times 0 0.3, right? What is about it? So mean from the calculation, so you have 15 inch the stair width requirement from this calculation but do you think the 15 inch wide stair is enough for the stair if stair width is easy to do using with this kind of a available to escaping from the 15 inches i think that is too narrow right so my question answer is no you should also check in a different code so you can just find out from here so from this calculation, initial calculation, you got a uh, 15 inches here. But you also have to be check section 1009 and section 1011. So when you just see the this, the code, when you have an accessible space, which is accessible space, you should meaning the 48 inch. Okay, you can see accessible minimal egress. Your clear width have to be meeting the 48 inches. And you can also find the different. The, if you having the stair width, and the width shall not be less than 44 inches. Okay? But occupant road is less than 50, you can actually reduce the 36 inches. But you have to be understanding about the, what is the difference between the 1009 and 1011. It is said the 1009, it's, it is called it requires more than 48 inches and 1011 it requires more than 44 inches so it means 48 inches versus 44 inches what kind of number you have to be provide okay so you can just find the one clue here the chapter the section 1009 it is required 48 inches in the accessible mean of egress what is about accessible mean of egress? So when your stair require accessible mean of egress, it need to meaning the 48 inches. However, just kind of typical stair, 
it doesn't, if it doesn't require accessible minor regress, you can just keep in the 484 inch. And if you have a less than 50 occupant load, you can make in the 36 inch wide stair. But what is about accessible minimal egress? So we discuss about the sprinkler building and non-sprinkler building. Non-sprinkler building, your stair have to be provide refuge area. The wheelchair, right? The if you have a fire, you cannot use the elevator. So it means wheelchair have to be the weight for rescue. So in this case, most refuge area in a stair. In a non-sprinkler building, the refuge area requirement in a stair weight. So from the, this region, accessible mean of egress, which is the non-sprinkler building, So means most ac the accessible the mean of egress you can find out from the non sprinkler system building, okay. So in this case, you have to be provide forty eight inch because about the refuge area wheelchair have to be stay in the stairway, and you have to be clear clear out people escaping right. So this rescue area and the refuge area only locating in the non-sprinkler building. However, if you have a sprinkler building, it doesn't require the refuge area. It means you can actually reduce the 44 inch from the 48 inches. Okay, so you need to be know about that. If you have a non-sprinkler building indicate your building doesn't have any sprinkler building, your egress have to be made accessible mean of egress. Accessible mean of egress means from the non-sprinkler building, so from the, this requirement, you have to be meet the 48 inch minimum stair width. However, if your building has the sprinkler building, uh, if your building has sprinkler system, you don't need to provide refuge area in a stairway. So from the, this region, you can reduce the stair width from the 48 inch to 44 inches. So in this case, you can just apply the 44 inch for the stair width. Also, if you have a sprinkler building, the occupant load is less than 50, you can reduce the 36 inches tear width from the, the 44 inches. Okay, but in this case, the building has the non sprinkler system, right? It is accessible minimum egress, so it means you have to provide a 48 inches here. So you understanding about the why we need a 44, 44 inch and 48 inch and 36 inches, right? And then from the 15 inch, we calculating from the previous slide, right? Basically from the 0.3 inch factors. So simply comparing 48 inch and 15 inch, the 48 inch is bigger than 15 inches. So therefore, you should apply the 48 inch for the your stairways, okay? Please understanding about the, this concept very carefully. Please follow the step by step. The which case you can apply the 48 inch minimum, which case you have to be applied the 44 inch minimum, which case you have to provide 36 inch minimum. Okay. And then your rending the may not be smaller in the depth than the stair width. The stair rending has to be keeping the turning distance, right? This turning radius. We'll look at the more detail to find the stair width later on this class. But remember width here, the your rending have to be the bigger than the stair width. So next example, if the occupant load is 200 per floor in non sprinkler building, which is the accessible, the minimal egress requirement, and how wide is the stair width? You're simply just getting the, this information here, right? You already the following the distraction. We have in the 200 people per floor, which is non sprinkler building. And then you just kind of find out the DC example, and it has the two axis here, right? So from the, this calculation, you can just getting it. So if each floor has for more than 50, it requires two separate axis here. This is a kind of a important the requirement. If your the floor have a more than fifty occupant, you should provide two axis stair. 
only if you just provide one access there, if your occupant is more than 50, it is illegal. If you have more than 50, you should provide two separated access there. We more to talk about this issue on the 445, how you can decide about the two access tier location. We talk about this one on the 445. But you have to be known right now, if your floor having more than 50 occupants, you should provide two separate access tier. So from this one, you just have a 200 per floor, which is have to be divided by two because two access tier. It means 200 by 2, and then this is non sprinkler reading, have to be applied to 0 0.3 inch factor. Now you can see 30 inch minimum width requirement. But you also need to check in the different the code, which is the IBC 1009.1. And because about this is non sprinkler reading, and it requires excess of minimum egress. So means have to be applied the 48 inches here. Okay. In this case, you have to be applied the 48 inch and and then you can just calculate from here 30 inch. The 48 inch is bigger. So from the this region, you have to be provide two 48 inch wide stair. So next example. So now you have a 900 per floor in a non sprinkler building and the how wide is the stair. So in also same situation, it is non sprinkler building and then it is considered the business and then you have uh, more than 50 people, it means you need a two stair requirement, right? And also it is the non sprinkler building, you have to be applied the 0 0.3 inches. Okay, so you can just following this kind of a calculation process. Now you have a uh, 50 occupant, you have to provide two egress stair minimum and then you just kind of simply just calculating from here 450 per floor right and then divide by two stair now you can get in the so 0 0.3 inch from the this factor so now you have a 67.5 inch minimum stair width requirement and also you can just comparing to the the 48 inch requirement in the non sprinkler building right so you can just simply comparing the 67.5 inch and 45, 48 inch. In this case, the previous one is 48 inches bigger. The front of this region, they using the 48 inch minimum steel width. But in this case, this calculation is the number is bigger than 48 inches. From this region, you can just provide the to the 67.5 inch wide steel. However, so when you just want to keep in the 48 inch rather than 67.5 inches in this case you actually adding the one more stair it means 450 in this case divided by 2 but in this case you can divide by 3 so now you have 150 occupant load per floor per each stair so I mean 150 the times 0 0.3 inch which is the from non sprinkler building in this case, it has the 45 inches. In this case, 45 inches the smaller than 48 inches. So from the this region, if you don't want to make in the this 67 inches, 7.5 inches the egress tier, you can do the 45 inches the wide the stair. But in this case, you have to be have three stair requirement rather than two stair requirement okay so you just kind of understanding about number four and number five concept from the this calculation right so now you can see the this calculation one more time Oops, sorry uh, you can see the five four hundred four the four hundred fifty and divide by the three in this case we have said about three and then 0 0.3 which is the non sprinkler factor now I have a 45 inches and 45 inches less than 48 inches. So in this case, so you can just kind of provide three, the 48 inch egress tear rather than two 67.5 inch wide stair. Okay, so you can choose either two stair or three stair. But when you choose the two stair, you have to meet in the 67.5 inch wide. But when you're choosing the three stair, you can choose the 48 inch wide stair. But Generally, we're choosing the two stair with this dimension, right? 
Um, next one, the when you just consider about the, your the egress stair and then the designing the door, the turning radius following the stair width. When you design the landing, you should consider about the door swing. Door swing may not reduce the required width by more than half. Okay, so this is a kind of swing side. This is have to be less than the half of the this swing side and then turning the dimension. So now we just kind of find out how we can design egress the switch back stair size. Okay. So what is about a good place to start for most moderate size building with a standard occupancy? You, know, you guys all know about access stair. It's a college of design. They have access stair the both sides, right? So it is usually, not usually, it is always enclosed by the fire protection wall. So that's why you have to be provide the efficient way to find out the number and demand for the egress stair. Because it doesn't have any kind of function. It only the for the egress escaping from the top to bottom. It doesn't have any concern about the aesthetic part. It also only more of a concern about the functional way. So from the, this region, do we more to the reduce the size and decrease the size to increase the other the habitable space? So from the, this region, you have to be calculating the the this egress stair to find out the optimized number for designing the stair. So but have to meaning the IBC code. But if you don't have a time, but the, also in a studio project, it don't need to be calculating the old number, but highly recommend to calculate the number to find the actual dimension. But in a studio place, you are first time to put the this dimension. This egress here, if your floor, floor, floor to floor height is 12 foot, is more about the typical dimension. In this case, you can meaning the 20 feet by 10 feet. Okay, this is a good starting point. So if you don't need to calculation, you just kind of put the 20 feet by 10 feet in a floor to floor height is 12 feet. In this case, it is mostly works for the, your the egress stair. But if you just want to make a more optimal number rather than this dimension, just try to reduce the, your egress stair as much as possible. In this case, you have to be calculating it. What is about this and what is about here? How we can calculate it? So you can simply starting from the this question here. It is the 200 per floor in a non sprinkler building. In this case, we already calculating here. In this non sprinkler building, which is the accessible mean of egress, so means we have to be calculation from here. It is a 30 inch, but have to be comparing to 48 inch. But 48 inch is bigger than 30 inch, so that's why it requires two 48 inch wide stair. So simply the floor to floor height from the, your the section design it is 12 feet and then we also know about the code minimum stair width which is the 48 inches which is the non sprinkler system which is the accessible mean of egress and then if we know the stair width we know the landing depth right the what is about the landing depth landing depth have to be more than the stair width, which is the here, is 48 inches minimum, right? It is uh, landing have to be the bigger than this stair width, right? So that's why you can just put the minimum number, which is the the 48 inches. So if you know the stair is a switchback, which a switchback is going up and going down, when you see the plan, the switchback stair, the landing, the both side, and then stair like this and then from here to here it's going up and then this is going down okay this is switch back stair so if you have a intermediate landing so means pro this is an intermediate landing from this going up and then you have a landing here and then going up and then you have a landing landing floor to floor and then this is a stair landing so we, I think this is enough information to sketch the stair arrangement here so from here you have a floor to floor, it's a 12 feet, and then landing is a switch back stair. We always have a landing. It is the always kind of a middle of the the, the the dimension from the floor to floor. So in this case you can just have to be calculating the this flight. So we also know about the, your stair width, which is a 48 inch, and then from the this one you can calculate in the landing area 
which is the more than 48 inches so that's why you just put the, the minimum dimension which is the 48 inches okay now we have to be calculating the this flight but how we can calculate in this flight so jumping back to the, this point we just can calculate in the floor to the landing so it is have a six foot right because about the floor to floor is 12 foot so means you can actually calculate in the total loan okay but from the, this one you can just can know about the 7-eleven row the light is 7 inch and the lawn is the which is the length the tree is 11 inches so from the, this one you have a maximum riser is 7 inch and then the floor to landing it is the 6 foot which is the 72 inches right so from the, this one you can actually calculate from here so 72 inch divided by 7 inch which is the 7 inch maximum now you have a 10.28 riser requirement we never have a 0 0.28 riser but if you choose a 10 you can either choosing the 10 riser or 11 riser but when you choose the 10 riser so you have a 72 inch divided by the 10 riser it means you have a 7.2 inch right in this case it's higher than 7 inch so in this case it doesn't work in a code of compliance so from the this region always have to be the round up and they have to be provide 11 riser for your stair in this case okay and then we just kind of calculate it one more time 72 inch floor to landing and divided by 11 riser calculation from here now each riser have the 6.55 inch it is less than 7 inch it means it works for the stair the code regulation okay so now we have 11 riser right from this calculation but what is about the treat so treat is kind of horizontal way but you have to be understanding about the treat always kind of one less than riser because the stair always starting from the riser right the this is the floor and then it always starting from the riser so from the this region if you have 11 riser you have a 10 treat because have to be minus one here okay so means from the, this one you know about the how many trade you requirement so means you need a 10 trade from here so 11 riser you need a 10 trade you also know about the, what is about the one trade dimension each trade have to be 11 inch right so from the, this calculation 11 inch times 10 trade it means the from the flight from flight it requires 110 inch which is 9 feet and 2 inches okay so now you know about this dimension. Each landing and floor is 48 inch because your stair have to be more than 48 inch. So means you also can calculate in the 10 treat and 11 inch. So now you can get in the 110 inch from here to from the the floor to the landing. Okay. So from here, so total the length from here to here, the you can just simply add 48 inch. 48 inch and 120 110 inch from this calculation your the length have to be 17 feet and 2 inches okay you just kind of understanding about the code minimum width switch back steer and determine the dimension of enclosure so you can simply understanding about the 48 inch here and then you already getting this dimension which is the the 110 inch so means you can just getting the total dimension here which is the 17 feet 2 inch it is much less than the very initial the calculation which is 10 by 20 but this is a more optimal dimension to find out the this tear from the calculation and then now we have to be understanding about the, this dimension here the particle dimension so this is uh, each part is 48 inch but we also consider about uh, some the guardrail in the middle place in this case it is very sometimes you can make in the less than six inch but we usually provide six inch between the this stair so from the this calculation now you got a eight foot six inch okay so when you just kind of first time we try the 10 foot by 20 foot box for the, your stair enclosure without calculation 
but when you actually find that calculation, find the optimal number, you can actually use uh, this dimension for the, your egress stair pass. Okay. Now we talk about the lamp. Uh, if lamp has the steeper than the one, one to twenty issued comply the IBC. So it means if you have a more gentler than 1 to 20, it doesn't count as the lamp. It doesn't require for meeting the IBC relating to the lamp. But if your slope is more than 1 to 20, it should be meaning as the lamp requirement the shown on the IBC. So it means what is about the 1 to 20 ratio? We already learning from the loop lecture. So if you have a 1 riser, then you have a 20 run, right? So it means you can just get in the, this dimension. What is about the lamp limit? Your lamp limit is 1 to 12. It have to be the least possible slope is always encouraged to be used. The maximum allowable slope is 1 to 12. If you have more than, steeper than 1 to 12, you should making out the stair rather than lamp. Okay? Lamp always meaning the 1 to 12 ratio maximum. Okay? Also understanding about it cannot exceed 30 inch vertical without rending. If you have more than 30 inch, higher than 30 inch riser, you should provide the rending space. Okay? It is the same as this. If you have a stair, if you have more than 12 feet, you should provide the rending area. But the, the lamp, if you have more than 30 inch, you should provide the rending space. Also, any rise higher than 6 inch, if you any rise here is more than 6 inch, you should provide handrail on the both side on the lamp. Okay? And then you still remember about the, the bottom extension, the 12 inch by 1 treat, which is uh, the 23 inch, and the top extension 12 inch, but lamp doesn't have any treat. That's why you can just kind of extending the 12 inch top and bottom okay and then you just kind of understanding about the, if you have more than six inch you have to provide handrail but if you have a uh, more than higher than 30 inch you should provide a guardrail okay and the lamp require 36 inch minimum width and 16 inch minimum rending so means width have to be more than 36 inches a landing area have to be provide 16 inch space. Why we need this 16 inch space? Because you should understanding about the wheelchair clear floor space, which is a 30 inch by 40 inch, right? Why 16 inch is important landing dimension? Because it is required for the the wheelchair turning radius. Wheelchair is coming, and you have to provide 16 inch turning and then change the direction. You can simply just find out that the wheelchair clear space 36, 30 by 48 inch and the 30 inch is less than 36 inch. So that's why it's kind of fitting for the wheelchair and the this dimension, everything this is decided from the, this, the clear floor space. This is a kind of a diagram you just can see. The when just wheelchair access, your rending have to be provide turning radius. In this case, you can provide a minimum 16 inch by 16 inch and then change the direction and it is going up, right? This is a kind of more about the basic concept to designing about this landing area and then the, the lamp design, the complies on the IBC. Uh, this is, I just kind of highlighting the important dimension for the, the stair and lamp design. I just kind of highlighting it. It is very important dimension to apply your design but you don't need to be memorize everything but I just ask you to to design stair or any lamp you can simply open the this the slide show and please apply to the this dimension to your design so but this is a have to be memorized 711 right which is a 7 inch larger 11 inch tree it is a very fundamental dimension you have to be memorized and you also remember what the, how you can use the 48 inch, 36 inch, and 48 inch the concept for designing about your stair. And then what is about the landing requirement? If your the height is more than 12 feet vertically, you should provide a landing space. 
In the lamp design, if your slope is some st steeper than 1 to 20, it is considered as a lamp, and then this slope and lamp should meet the minimum IBC requirement. But maximum slope have to be 1 to 12, and then the steel width is 36 inches, and the, the lamp width is 36 inches. And the landing area have to be more than 60 inch diameter because of the turning radius. A handrail have to be meaning the 34 inch to 36 inch and guardrail have to be meaning the 42 inch and head clearance have to be meaning the 80 inch. This is a very important dimension so but I just ask you to memorize for now steer 711 and then how you can get calculating the steer width and then understanding about the handrail height and then guardrail height and then head clearance and you just kind of understanding about the if you have a steeper than 1 to 20 you should meet in the lamp the code requirement but this slope have to be less than 1 to 12. I think this top mark you should know and I think highly ask you to memorize this dimension okay because this is a very important dimension you always apply the, this dimension for your design okay I think so the last lab is on the canvas so I know that two labs are happening in this week so I just kind of uh, explaining more after the, this lecture recording so how we can submit the, these two the labs in the same time so means I just kind of little bit adjusting about time and everyone know the uh, module one is only about four and a half weeks so from the, this region the lab is complete the these two labs complete this situation but I just kind of explaining how we can actually manage the, this lab schedule anyway um thank you so much for the the module one the, we have a pre busy schedule the within the four and a half weeks we have uh, eight lectures straight and every lecture content is very important to the understanding about the next step so please kind of uh, watch the this the recording the lecture recording on the youtube i think this is a, you can summarize yourself to understanding about the concept of the wall concept about the code and concept about accessibility so without this understanding it's very difficult to, to continue to the next step which is the next class which is the 347 and the 547 so please leave it yourself and then through the, the review if you have any question please contact me I can meet you guys in a Zoom in a person okay so let me know and then thanks again for all your the patient and then concentration on the class okay so after this recording just please stay here stay here for a while because I have to be explaining about the rest of the some schedule for the module one okay thanks again and then so see you very soon